Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here, Mark. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the work that I did uh, during my PhD in Mark's lab here at Stanford. Um, and my dissertation was titled Getting a Gecko Grip Surface Conformation for Dry Adhesion Assisted Robotic Grasping. So I will start first by um, giving some context uh, on the topic of surface conformation, how to sort of wrap around, conform to something. And it's, it's a thing that we see in nature quite a bit. Uh, a lot of animals, when they're trying to traverse their terrain, you'll see they will have, you know, either they're wrapping around a branch or, or, or something that they're trying to maneuver over. Um, and even when we handle tools or different things in our day to day, you always see that we're trying to have these enveloping grasps. We're trying to really take advantage of conforming to that surface. So it's interesting when we look at a very special animal, like the gecko, and you can see it climbing on surfaces without having to do this wrapping around and holding on to different um, like objects. In fact, um, what we see here is a gecko holding on upside down to a flat piece of glass, um, and it's doing it really well. And we wanted to understand how it's able to do this, so we had to take a closer look um, at its toes. And what we found um, when looking into this is there are two main principles behind how this works that I will focus on um, for the sake of today. The first is called Van der Waals forces, and the second is called contact splitting. For Van der Waals forces, these are weak forces on the, um, on the atomic level that uh, basically come up uh, when the atoms get really close to each other. So we're talking sub um, 10 nanometers. Um, and you get this, uh, these attractive forces between them. So that's like what has been identified as the driving force for the gecko being able to have these uh, adhesive properties on surfaces. The other thing that's important to note is called contact splitting. So imagine you have a scenario where you have um, a hemisphere like this, and you have some amount of contact area A. If I take this contact area and then I split it, or sorry, this contact area requires some amount of force to be able to detach from the surface. There's some type of act, or, um, adhesive, adhesive energy that, that is existing there that we need to then apply some amount of force to detach. If we take this area and then split it up across N hemispheres, we now need a new force to be able to detach. And in fact, this force is going to be larger. Um, and this basically comes down to uh, mitigating crack propagation. Um, and now you have to sort of um, detach a lot of different contact points at the same time to get this, this catastrophic failure. And this is uh, an interesting thing that what happens here is, so the more we split the contacts, the more adhesion we get, but it becomes more challenging to guarantee that we're still making the same amount of contact area with the other surface. And so how does the gecko do this? Um, the way that it makes sure to get this contact is by having this hierarchy of structures on its toe. So if we zoom in um, down all the way to the nanometer scale, we can see it kind of branches to little uh, lamellae and setae on the gecko's toe. And that helps it conform to irregularities in the surfaces that it's trying to climb on making sure it keeps that area of contact there to get that van der Waals force um, and maintain its, its adhesion. So, you know, we thought this was cool. And um, Mark's lab over, over the years developed uh, a material that can do something like the gecko. Uh, and it's called gecko-inspired dry adhesive. It's made up of, well, it's silicon rubber, but it has these tiny micro features that look like uh, tapered micro edges. And what happens um, when you load these features in shear is that they start to lay down and the contact area increases. So you get more adhesion, so it's controllable. And so what I have here is a sample of this gecko adhesive. And I can touch it, it's not sticky, it's made of rubber. When I place it onto a surface and I shear it, it can do stuff like this. And you will say, oh, I can do that with duct tape. But you can't really do this with duct tape. So it's controllable, it's not sticky, which means it doesn't need a lot of energy into the system to detach, which is useful um, for some applications. 
So what I did um, during my work here is I um, studied the manufacturing process quite a bit when I started to understand how we can make this material, how we can maybe scale it, make it uh, more accessible, and understand what goes into successful manufacturing of that, which if you have questions about that, you can ask me after um, the presentation. But more importantly, I also looked at once we have the material, how can we ensure that we get good uh, surface conformation like what the gecko does, except you know, in this case, we maybe don't have a sophisticated system like the gecko. Uh, so um, you know, throughout my research, I looked at different length scales that we have to address uh, in order to achieve good contact area. But for today, I'd like to focus on one of the projects that I worked on, which involves how to effectively use the adhesive in a robotic setting where you have a single arm picking operation and you have limited exposure of the target object. So you have maybe access to one surface of the target object. Um, and how can we use the adhesion effect uh, effectively, perhaps with some more traditional robotic grippers that we've seen. So the motivation for, the, for this project, like I said, is you have a limited working area. So let's assume you don't have a box and you have two sides and you're coming in and trying to pick it up on both sides. You have one face that's exposed to you. The other thing is that there's no guarantee here of what the surface is going to look like um, because we're dealing with maybe a wide array of objects we're trying to pick up. So they might be not flat, deformable, um, you know, what have you. And, and mostly we're looking at um, mesoscale length scale, which is basically on the millimeter scale. And this scenario is a good way to describe a task that we all do very often, which is perhaps grocery shopping. Uh, and we're, we're good at this task. So it's, it's a single arm manipulation task with a variety of objects that are all um, have different uh, surface properties. And they're all tightly packed, which means there's only one face that's exposed to us to deal with, usually. And like I said, we're really good at this. But then if you put a robot here, it's not maybe as good as a human at doing this. But the problem is the same. You have a single arm manipulation task with a wide variety of objects that are all tightly packed. And uh, in the literature and in, in industry, some of the more common robotic tools that we use are the suction tool and the parallel jaw gripper. But when you think about only have one, having one exposed face, you, you immediately go to, oh, we probably need a suction tool here, because we don't have parallel faces of an object that we can come in with a parallel jaw gripper and grab. So that's why we're focusing more on, on that tool. But what happens when you introduce an interesting, uh, challenging um, you know, variety of objects that the suction tool cannot pick up because they're heavy, they're um, deformable, which means you can't get a good, get a good seal um, with the tool. And um, some um, places in industry, you, you see solutions here where you have like a big array of suction cups. They come in from the top, and they can, they can handle um, you know, different packaging and different bulky items. But what we notice here is they are coming in from a top grasp. And you have a very large area that you're working with. Versus this specific task, we're coming in from the side. And we have less exposed area to work with. And so we start to see failure modes that look like the one at the top, where the suction cup just can't, can't pick up the items. So the question is, how can we leverage maybe um, some of the benefits of suction cups, um, but also augment them with um, the gecko adhesive that we have that can provide good synergy. And how can we make sure that it's conforming and giving us uh, good surface conformation in these, in these spaces? So as any good mechanical engineer will tell you, the first thing you want to do is figure out what your free body diagram for the system looks like. Basically, we want to understand what failure modes we might experience when we're dealing with this task. So purely just a suction cup, um, this is a very simplified 2D representation of what's happening. It's more complicated than that, but for the sake of understanding what's going on. If you come in just with a suction cup and try to pick up an object such as this, you experience something uh, that we call a peeling failure, where the object torques, twists off the front surface of the suction cup. OK, well, you can say we can solve this problem by adding um, a reaction point that stops it from rotating off the front surface of uh, the suction cup. Sure. So we added that. 
Um, and now we have um, some leverage there to stop the torquing failure. But then what happens is you don't have enough force to counteract the weight of the object, and so you slip off the surface. So that's another failure mode. These could happen at the same time, but this is generally what we're dealing with. And to address that, well, we add some upward force, like, say, our dry adhesion, um, in a very simple critical function prototype here to show if this principle will even work. And in fact, it works quite well. Um, but it's not enough to slap uh, flexible film onto uh, an acrylic piece like that. We want to give it a little more thought to make it more robust. So a new material that we introduced with the manufacturing process of the gecko adhesive is called ripstop, which is used in making um, camping gear. So pretty tough, tear resistant, super flexible. Um, and that's what we see uh, over here. So it's basically nylon fibers, and it's inextensible along the direction of the fibers. Um, and we can cast silicon onto it because it is um, silicon coated as well. And how do, we how do we make sure this makes contact with the surface of our objects? A simple but very effective way is giving it a steady stream of airflow. So essentially a fan, um, because you want compliance. And what, more, what is more compliant than a stream of air? So um, what happens here, and I'll, I'll try to play this video again, is that once the object, is it going to play again? No? Yeah, it is. Uh, once the object makes contact with the film and it becomes taut, that's where you see the engagement happening. That's where the adhesion is starting to take place. And um, bringing this all together, we don't want to sacrifice the performance of the suction cup, which can actually do a really good job with smaller items, lighter items, things that are not deformable. Um, so we made uh, a gripper that can deploy when needed to assist the suction cup when picking up specific items. Um, and so this is a very you know, mechanical solution here. There's one servo motor. Things are deploying, locking into place, fans turning on with a limit switch. Basically, the setup, the linkage setup is so that any force from the object doesn't close um, what you've deployed, but you can still um, retract everything with that single servo command again. So it's trying to limit as much complications with um, integrating into like, you know, the software side of the robot, which if we can do that, why not? Um, understanding how this works, how this improves our performance, um, we look at two far ends of the uh, of the spectrum here, which is on rigid surfaces, um, we see that the way the load sharing is happening is after, in this case, about seven newtons of load on the suction cup, it begins to deflect. And that's when your adhesive starts to take off some of that load. Um, and you can see a linear trend. The more weight we add into the setup, the more that's being held up by the adhesive. But it's interesting because that's not exactly what's happening in deformable, more um, deformable objects like, like bags. Um, we, we see here that it's, uh, the suction cup is able to sort of pull in that, that bag surface more. Um, and this causes a different trend in how the load sharing is happening. But in the end, um, you, know, you get to the point where the excess weight that's being added is still being taken up by the adhesive. Um, so uh, in addition to this, though, uh, another interesting thing we learned is, has to do with timing. So you can affect how soon you begin to load your adhesive by adding some type of preload in your grass planning strategy. Uh, so basically, if you're worried that your suction cup is going to fail and you really don't want to load it so much in that direction, you add, you come in in a way and preload the adhesive before you start lifting um, before you, you take off the object off the, off the shelf uh, and start loading your suction cup. Um, and that, what that does essentially is shifts that linear trend back so you're loading the suction cup less early, basically. Um, overall, the performance of the tool um, was improved by two and a half fold uh, for more rigid objects. But when it comes to deformable things, it went it was binary. It was like it didn't work, and then it did work, because you were going from not being able to get a seal to having something that um, uh, helps the suction cup so much that it can now actually pick up the items. And uh, what's cool is that we got to uh, test this on a uh, robot that was developed by Toyota Research Institute. 
And here are some of the different items that we were able to pick up using this tool that the robot couldn't pick up previously with just a suction cup tool. Um, and I will show you a few videos of some of the highlights that I think are the most um, uh, fun ones to look at uh, across a variety of objects. So the first one is a um, cardboard box here, uh, quite heavy, um, of, it's a box of trash bags, but um, basically what you see on the left is the suction cup failing to pick up the box and then the new tool uh, being able to, to handle it uh, quite effectively. So this is for a rigid object. Um, and then next, uh, the other object we see is a bag of powdered sugar, which is still heavy, pretty deformable, um, and quite a challenge for suction cups. And you can see here how much adding that um, alleviation of, of weight is helping uh, with the gripper. And then uh, finally, it was our white whale, basically, of this pack, nine pack bag of toilet paper, which it's exciting because it's heavy and it's pretty deformable. Not a lot of tools can do this with just that front face being exposed, and it does a pretty good job of doing that as well. Um, so for me, this was my, at least the project that I was most excited about, that I was very interested in working on uh, in my most recent project uh, throughout the PhD. Um, if you have more questions uh, about this or some of the other projects I've worked on, I'd love to answer them. Uh, thank you all so much for listening, uh, and I hope this was insightful. And if anyone wants to play with this, you certainly can. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, using the robot when you, you are trying to grasp objects, how were you actually locating those objects and how were you deciding the point of contact with your ripper, which should be the start point of the show? Totally. Yeah, that's a good question. So this, is a, so this is a project where you have a whole team working on it. Basically, they built the robot from the ground up, and so you have a team that's doing more of the controls and a team that's doing more of the, the hardware. Um, but what I can tell you from what I learned uh, working with this team, is basically you have um, prior knowledge of the items in your inventory, basically. And so you can, um, so you have information about the weight and the location of the center of mass of the object. And for the strategy for picking items in this case was to situate the suction cup um, as close to the top edge of the item um, as one could get safely um, to mitigate any you know, unwanted torquing um, in that scenario. Uh, and let me think. So part of how you, um, in this case, they were trying to maintain the pose of the item and always keep it as it is on the shelf. So it made it easier to, to make sure that the adhesive was being loaded the whole time. Um, but I think if we went a step further and wanted to, to load things like uh, more control, we load the adhesive first, we can try to adjust the pose of the end effector more such that you can come in at an angle, load the film first, and then make contact with the suction cup. Um, and, and you can get more clever with the strategies there. But this was like, what's the simplest thing you can get away with um, to achieve this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the requirement on the surface qualities of your object for the suction cup and the tape? I mean, the dead road is it to be effective? To be what was effective? effective? Uh, yeah. So gecko adhesive works quite well with smooth surfaces, um, mainly because the less you know dips and valleys in your surface, the more contact area you get. Um, so things that could be more challenging um, are something like really rough cardboard. But in the scenario of the grocery store, a lot of the stuff is nice and laminated, and you've got nice pictures on everything. So it's a good application in this space. Um, but if you wanted to go further and try to apply it to a more wider variety of, of things, we've done um, like combining it with some interesting electrostatic stuff to improve the contact area with the objects. But in this case, if you're just using the gecko adhesive by itself, it does quite well with smooth surfaces. Uh, the suction cup does really well with flat ridges surfaces because you can get a good seal and in fact you could even turn off your suction and hold that in, or turn off your vacuum and hold the suction in place. When it comes to deformable objects you have to keep running it to basically you're continuously pulling it towards your gripper. Um, so those are, those are the different considerations and um, 
effective like surfaces that we can use this on. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing the modeling of the graph, do you need to uh, at all model the stochasticity in the graph? And then follow up from that, do you have, like, is there a way to kind of have contingency plans if your first grasp mm. doesn't succeed? That's an interesting question. Uh, that is a more of like a long-term question, and the team that's working on this robot is always trying to make sure that the throughput is higher every time they iterate. Um, personally, I was not working on the, the grass planning myself, um, but the idea is, um, you know, get to the point where it's going to work every time, which is, you know, it's a great goal to have. Um, but it would be a good idea to maybe have, like you said, a backup plan. Like, what happens if something slips? How can we kind of recover from it? They're not implementing that at the moment. Maybe they should. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a great point um, to bring up, for sure. Cool. Are we good on time? We're OK? Yeah? <laughs> If we yeah. don't have any more questions, we can wrap up here. Let's, let's hear it for our student speakers. Awesome job, guys.